Hello, and I'd like to, to welcome you to the third in our, our series of four one-to-one -one interviews for our 2021 Offshore Wind Energy Conference. I'm delighted to be joined uh, for this one by Mary Donnelly, formerly the Director General at the European Commission for Energy Efficiency, Renewable Energy and Innovation, and Founding Chairperson of Renewable Energy Ireland, and now, of course, Chairperson of the Climate Change Advisory Council. So dealing with climate change, Mary, it sounds like the jobs are getting more and more difficult as, as, time, as time passes. Um, I really like to, to thank you for joining us. And I think maybe to, to start off for those in the audience who might not be familiar with the Climate Change Advisory Council, could you talk a little bit about its role and maybe particularly, I suppose, its big task, setting a carbon budget for Ireland? I mean, what, what is that? What does a carbon budget for Ireland actually look like? Well, firstly, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to have this conversation today, Justin. It's my pleasure, I can, uh, as always, to have a conversation with you. Uh, the Climate Change Advisory Council, it's an independent body, so we're independent of government and we are science-based. And our job is to advise the government on the achievement of our climate neutral objective by 2050. But, you know, 2050 is a long way away. So part of the process is that we take smaller bite-sized approaches to it and we set ourselves five yearly carbon budgets so that it's much more proximate and real to our daily lives and the carbon budget basically is a ceiling it sets the limit for the amount of emissions that we can emit during a five-year period so uh, the council's first task this year was to come out with the advice to the government on the five-year budget for uh, 2021 until 2025. The first year, of course, of that is almost gone already. A second budget from 26 to 30, and a provisional one then from 2031 to 35. And that that starts a process and i think the process is important for colleagues to to have an appreciation of because once the the carbon budget comes out then the government takes that budget and allocates it across sectors so sectors like transport building industry electricity agriculture whatever and then the ministers in those sectors take responsibility for staying within that budget so you can imagine the political allocation of the budget is quite sensitive because uh, it's harder or easier for sectors to achieve the 51% reduction, which is what the legislation has required us to achieve by 2030. And in order to do that, it's very important that government puts in place the policies and the processes that allows us to achieve these emission reductions. And that's where the Climate Action Plan comes in. And there'll be a new climate action plan coming out shortly. Uh, it sets out the various measures, policy changes and policy initiatives for each of the sectors. Uh, that climate action plan will be updated then on an annual basis, hopefully because this year's act actions will have been done and they will be replaced by new ones next year. And then the council comes in again then on an annual basis to say, are we on track it, by sector? Are we going in the right direction? Do we need to do more? Uh, do we have a little bit of... Uh, slack here or whatever. So that's really what, it's, it's kind of an annual cycle process that will lead us to achieving the very ambitious targets that we have in place. And you, you mentioned allocating um, greenhouse gas emissions by, by sector there. I suppose, I mean, obviously, offshore wind energy, renewable electricity, we're going to be very keen to see what kind of targets are set there in the electricity sector. How important is offshore wind particularly to to did that decarbonization agenda that you set out well can i start firstly with electricity because uh, you know as they often say electricity to some extent is our anchor tenant uh, for for a number of reasons firstly we have very important volumes of natural resource so it's a natural opportunity for us in ireland to use wind and solar as the source for our electricity and that of course is carbon free so it's a kind of a win-win situation all around secondly we have technologies and you know they're very competitive we know how to use them and that's an important uh, opportunity for us to roll it out as quickly as possible the challenge for electricity is to get the volume up because we need very large volumes of course for renewable uh, electricity and this is where the offshore becomes hugely important because it's a you know it's a very large number that we're talking about in terms of particularly the legacy projects on the east coast but electricity also has a very important role to play in the whole decarbonization activity because you are the vehicle for decarbonization at least in the first phase for transport for heat and for industrial processes so 
it will be very hard to achieve the objectives in the other sectors if we don't get the numbers right in the electricity sector. And that's why onshore wind, but particularly offshore wind, is, is very important in, as part of this process. Okay, so no, no pressure then. No pressure. Um, well, there is a little pressure, perhaps, just in question in, ter in terms of timing, and it may be what you were going to say anyway. I mean, uh, we have two five-year budgets, of course, and part of the, the concern that we have is how to allocate the available emissions between the two five-year periods. And the council is, is currently struggling with, you know, is it 50-50 or do we have to take account of the feasibility of achieving uh, the emissions reductions? And there is a reality uh, of lag time that, you know, both policies and technologies need to be rolled out. And one of the key areas is to roll out enabling infrastructure and, you know, electricity, particularly the grid, is really up there because without that, we cannot achieve our other targets. There are other enabling infrastructures like district heating that we also need to roll out now in order to get the benefit. But the benefit, in fact, will only come probably in the second budget. So we're trying to balance that to see how quickly these technologies can actually deliver. Will it be the first budget? Will it be the second budget? And can we take account of that accordingly? Okay. I think that really works in well with one of the themes of the conference that, that we've had is, is the urgency and the need for us to develop those those big, as you said, the legacy projects as quickly as possible. Um, it'd be great to get them up and running for the first five years, but, but I think maybe their, their bigger contribution will be to, towards the end of the decade. And you, you mentioned the role, if we can go back to, to something you said a moment ago, you mentioned the role that renewable electricity will play in, in decarbonizing heat and transport. And I just wanted to tease that out a little bit because I, I sometimes feel there's they're not necessarily competing against each other. But you do get this sense sometimes you have people saying that, well, one of the ways that renewable electricity can decarbonize there is we electrify heat and transport, so electric vehicles and heat pumps. You have others saying the focus should perhaps be on green hydrogen, that that's what we should be producing to power our vehicles, to heat our homes. Do you have a, a perspective on that? Is, is, is there one of those that you think is actually going to deliver the bigger bang for the carbon budget more quickly? Well, I, I think we have, we have two things to think about here. One is what is available today? because we need to use whatever is available today, we need to use it today. And the second issue is the feasibility of rollout. So I think that uh, hydrogen in the longer term will be hugely important, but none of the estimates that I have seen have seen hydrogen becoming available in the kind of quantities and at the kind of prices that are likely to have a huge impact on the first two budgets. So we're probably looking really around about the end of this decade before hydrogen really hits the ground running. That means we have got to use electricity. We've got to use it in the transport space. We've got to use it in the heat space. And we have the technologies and we can see even now that people are starting to you know, vote with their, with their wallets. They're starting to buy electric vehicles, uh, a huge increase in purchase of electric vehicles. People are now aware of heat pumps and the opportunity for that. And for me, the issue is we use the technology, it's cost effective, we use it now. Hydrogen is a huge resource for this country because we do have the offshore wind, floating wind possibilities off the West Coast. We will be able to produce hydrogen. Hopefully the, the costs will come down. But the strategic question I think we have to ask ourselves is, what do we use the hydrogen for? Do we use it to produce electricity? Do we use it to boil an egg? Do we use it to put it into tankers and send to the rest of the world? Or do we use it in a strategic way as an economic motor of our engine in Ireland going forward in a decarbonized world? So I think there's a big, a big opportunity there, but also I think we have to seriously think about the strategy around hydrogen. It's good, but let's use what we have today. <laughs> Building the new renewable electricity, you mentioned infrastructure a, a few months ago, and I, I know from your, your time working with, with us in Renewable Energy Ireland, you're very aware of the challenges that are out there in terms of grid capacity in, in, in Ireland and also the challenges that you know sometimes we can face in actually delivering projects. And sometimes I think we're facing a communications challenge as much as it is an, an engineering one. So how, how do you think we should be looking at bringing Irish society with us? How do we get people who are passionate about climate change to be as equally passionate about grid infrastructure and, and new wind farms and solar farms. Is there a role here for the council? Is there a role here for industry? How do we, how do we bring society with us? 
well, I think you've put your finger on the most difficult challenge that we have. You know, uh, as we go forward with the ambition for climate uh, action, firstly, it's going to be expensive and we, we don't hide that. Uh, we have to have new innovations, new technologies, and that those hopefully will come through. But of all of the things that are, will challenge us is the, the minds, the hearts and minds of people in the country. Uh, we, have a, we have a challenge that we need to be able to move from the scare of climate change, floods and fires, into what does this really mean for me in my daily life? What does it mean for me in my job and in the business I work in? What does it mean for me in the way we run our country? And to, to appreciate that in a way that doesn't give fear to people, but rather gives opportunity. Because, you know, the vision at the end of this, it's a society that is sustainable. It's a society that is successful. We have clean air. We have clean water. We have healthy lifestyles. We have warm, comfortable homes. This is our objective. So the real challenge will be, how do we try to demystify the technologies in such a way that people can grasp they exist and support their rollout? And yes, in that context, the council really does have a role to play, but you know, we're kind of five and a half people and a dog. Uh, so it won't be just the council clearly doing it. This, this is a job for everybody. And industry has a hugely important role in this context. I, I think we start with, you know, government has to set the leadership, it has to set the policies, it has to put the structures in place. Industry then uses those and delivers sustainable products, sustainable services. But in doing so, they are the interface to people. And the role that industry can play is enormous. And we often hear of companies talking about, you know, we have a zero carbon target for 2030, the case may be, for the most part, that's scope one, scope two ambitions. We really need companies to go into the scope three area and interact with both their suppliers and their customers because you know the replication possibilities of companies having that conversation is enormous. And yes, people like ourselves in the council, yes, we should do it as well. We all have a role to play, but I think it's absolutely the most difficult challenge that we have facing us in the next decade. Yeah, I think a bit of a, a challenge there maybe for us to, to, to continually try to find ways to up our game as an industry in, in selling, because I really like the line you had a moment ago, we're turning from away from fear and towards opportunity, and that that's kind of what we need to communicate as well. I, I might finish with, with one last question, it's kind of on the same topic. You mentioned there that it's a, it's a task for everybody, it's a task for government. I think one of the things that I, I, you see often in a lot of political issues is you have the government on one side and you have the opposition on, on the other. Um, how important is it that we build a, a political consensus behind this, the climate change, action on climate change? It's not a political football. If we're going to be building carbon budgets over a series of years, we need everybody to throw in behind it. And just because you're on the opposition benches doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have responsibility. I think that's absolutely a key issue and, and the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Climate Change that we have and that has allowed the development of the Climate uh, Act is a fundamental requirement. I, I've seen it happen in other countries where, you know, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, where politicians have accepted to cut out climate action and put it to one side. That's not political. That's social. That's something we're doing for society today and society in the future. And it's not a political football. And I think that's the basis for the Joint Oireachtas Committee. That's the only way that we will be able to deliver this. It cannot become a political football. We're all in this game. We all need to contribute and we all need to deliver. We all have, a bit, we all have our, our own part to play. Mary, I want to thank you very much for, for joining us for our offshore conference. Really enjoyed the conversation. And I, I hope those uh, who, were, who were watching did as well and, and, and got something out of it. And I think as well, listen to the challenge being put before industry to develop those projects and to bring people along to communicate the benefits that, that the projects we're trying to deliver will bring for coastal communities and, and for Ireland as a whole. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Justin.